years ago, um, I remember a lady working at an information center at the church we were attending at the time. And I remember wishing that I could have the confidence that she did in talking to people and welcoming people and answering questions they may have about what the church has to offer. Little did I know then um, that God was already planting in my heart the desire to do just that. Serving at Calvary Assembly has been so rewarding for me. Um, I've served in a few areas and each area was so welcoming and um, I was encouraged to find the best fit for me and my family without being a burden, something that I would enjoy. Uh, I love when new people come to the Welcome Center, faces that I haven't seen before. Um, and usually they'll ask a question and that prompts a conversation and I love getting to know them a little bit and sharing with them different things that our church has to offer them or their family. And, I always ask if they have children, so I can tell them about the children's ministry or other events that we have here at church. And I just love their smile, and um, I always ask them to come back at the end of service to tell me how they liked it. In serving, I get filled up, and it gives me energy, and also I feel like I'm growing spiritually, uh, being around other people that are serving with me as well. Having servant leaders here at Calvary has inspired me to want to serve with my whole heart, and. Um, I'm hoping to make the Welcome Center be the best that it can be to support the vision here at Calvary. It was 20 years ago when Pastor Bob and Sue moved into North Charlotte and we were backyard neighbors. And they introduced themselves and everything was fine and then I found out he was a pastor and I got really nervous because I just didn't know how to behave around a pastor. And I just wasn't there yet. So then in 2006, we moved to our current neighborhood and met the Carapazes, and Michelle was telling me about this awesome church that she goes to, and I said, yeah, 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 and she just kept talking and talking about this church, and she finally said, Pastor Bob, and I went, wait a second now, what church is it? And she told me Calvary Assembly, and I said, well, I know him. So I started thinking about it, and she kept bringing it up a lot, and finally it was a year ago last November, we decided to give it a try. She said that when she comes here on Sundays and listens to Pastor Bob, that she always gets something from his message. And we came and we've been coming every Wednesday and Sunday since. And our family is going through some pretty rough times right now. And church for us is safety, security, and we just feel very at home here. The boys, well, they came and they went to their kids' classes, but it was kind of hard to come into a place by myself, but everybody was very welcoming. Everybody, you know, was very friendly, and, and I felt right at home about five minutes after I walked in the door. It's fun, it's enjoyable, and every week I have fun. And I just really enjoyed the music, and then when we went downstairs, we got a good message and I made a lot of friends. I feel a lot more at peace. I, I don't, I'm not so scared. And uh, church sets me up for the whole week. It's like when I leave here on Sunday, it's like I can handle anything that comes my way. Yeah, and I pray every day and it just, it just feels right being here. And I know it's been good for all of us. We, we've all grown spiritually since we've been here. And it was very important to me to have them a sense of, have a sense of God and Jesus because before we came here, I would tell them who Jesus was and talk about God, but if you don't really experience it, you don't get it. So we've all grown. You know it's a house of grace when we let young men wear Steelers hats around here. <laughs> We think the information we're going to share is not just for leadership to know or members to know. You're here and you're welcome to know what we know. And this is what I want you to see in 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. It says, it's required that those who've been given a trust, that they prove themselves faithful. What we're talking about today is a way of us being accountable to you. We want to establish that we are faithful. It also tells us in Luke 15, suppose one of you loses a hundred sheep 
and or supposedly has 100 sheep and loses one of them, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is what I want you to hear today. We're going to talk a lot of information. And it's really important that you understand we never forget this. And I don't want you to think that we have. And that is that every number represents a person. And every person has a story. And every person matters. When we talk about attendance, we're talking about people. When we talk about generosity, we're talking about people. So all of the numbers represent an individual, and every single one of those individuals has a story. You'll notice on this graph that we've had a continual growth cycle in our church. In fact, of the 20 years that we've been here, uh, we have had 18 years of growth. And no year has been spectacular growth, but every year has been a little bit of growth. And so this year, uh, 2017, uh, we actually saw 646 people on average attendance in our Sunday morning services. That represents a 10, a uh, little bit over a 10% increase. Now, this is what's fascinating. This is what I love. You folks invite other people to come check out what the grace of God might look like. And so there were th over 300 people that were first-time guests at Calvary Assembly over the course of the last year. And they came because you invited them. And we think there were more than that, but these are the ones that filled out a connection card. Now, please look at the next number. 98 per, uh, people, 98 people crossed the line of faith and accepted the grace of God into their lives, which means that one out of every three guests that walk into the doors walk out influenced by the grace of God and making a decision that they want to follow him all the days of their life. I think that's a really big deal. I really do. 392 people are active volunteers in our church. That means that out of our regular attenders, over 60% are active volunteers. What blows me away is that last year, 127 of you decided to serve for the first time. And in order for us to do a service on a Sunday, it requires over 145 people every single Sunday just to make sure that all of our ministries are taken care of and all of our attenders are served. And so, that is just an amazing statistic. Six out of every 10 people who show up here serve. How many think that's a really good thing? All right? So here's our goal. 10 out of 10. <laughs> Everybody, Because serving is how we change our world, and it's how we make a difference. I'm going to talk about some of the financials and the total income that came into our church. Now, when I give this number... What I want you to know is that this is not just our donations. There are resources that come into our church because of registrations for events or maybe they're buying T-shirts. None of those are considered donations, but we keep careful and accurate accounting of all resources, whether it's donated or part of other revenue streams. And so for the first time in the history of Calvary Assembly, we went over a million dollars in total income, $1,184,924. I think that's a really big deal. A million and 59,000 of that came in for our tithes and offerings, and that means uh, that's, that's the most uh, freeing way anyone gives to our church family because it allows a lot of latitude for our leadership to determine how that money is spent. But in addition to that, there was over $49,000 that was given to missions. There was t over uh, $28,000 that was given to benevolence. I just want to tell you this, that when we got into December last year, we were down to about $1,000 in our benevolence account. And uh, heading into January, it, it, it's a really difficult time of the year. On Christmas Eve, you folks gave and replenished our uh, uh, benevolence account. On Christmas Eve, you gave over $8,000 in a single night to help people who are struggling and going through difficult times, and I am so grateful for that. 
Over $10,000 came in towards the building. Now we've already budgeted for our building expenses, so when any money comes in towards the building, we pay down in advance on our mortgage. So not only does those contributions help eliminate future uh, indebtedness, it also decreases the amount of interest that we pay out over time, and so we're so grateful for that. Over $35,000 came in through registrations, events, things like that that we host here. And then another $1,540 came in on interest. The church doesn't get any better interest on our accounts than you do on yours. So that's how that goes. What this represents is last year in 2017, over 2018, the increase in tithes and offerings giving was $248,059, an increase in a single year. I think we need to thank God for that. It's just absolutely amazing. And we see something that you never see in church world. If you're not involved in ministry or administrative aspects of nonprofits, this next number is astonishing. Our attendance was increased by 10%, but our giving increased by 30%. And that never happens. It's always more attendance, less giving. And here's why I think it happened. Two reasons. One is, I think that as we are growing in our faith, we're taking our stewardship of life responsibilities more seriously. We're learning to be generous, and I think that that shows up in our giving. And secondly, I honestly believe that when we start exercising generosity, God knows we're going to, be, we're going to share what we have and he blesses us even more. And I think that God is doing that in your lives, and I think that he's doing that in our lives. By the way, of all those volunteer hours that were uh, provided by our volunteers over the course of the last year, if we had to pay minimum wage for our volunteer hours, it would have cost us an additional $176,266. That's how much money was saved by people just showing up and serving. It makes a huge difference around here. Now, when it comes to expenses, our total expenses was $802,063. Let's just go through this a little bit. $172,000 of that went to ministries. That's our benevolence. That's our kids' ministries. That's our students. That's college. That's all the ministries that we engage in around here. As you can see, we spend a lot of money to make sure that people are well served in our church family. We also spent $62,740 in missions. And if you remember, our income to missions was a little over $49,000, which means every dollar you gave in missions, we not only gave that to our missionaries, but we added another $13,000 on top of that because we believe in what they are doing and we want to be generous. We don't just ask you to be generous. We want to be generous too. And then we had uh, $386,930. That is what pays for our personnel. This is all of our staff salaries. And in case you think I'm the only staff around here and I make $386,000, <laughs> I can assure you that is not the case. <clears throat> we actually have 18 staff members that are part of the Calvary family. Four of those are full-time. The rest that are part-time are everything from a few hours to up to 30 hours in the course of a week. And we're so grateful for all the ways that they serve. That number includes not only the salary portions, but it also includes all the taxes, insurances, things that we have to contribute as an employer to cover that cost. Now, we do not break down and disclose individual staff salaries uh, to our church family. We believe that each of those individuals has a right to some privacy regarding their income, just as you have a right to yours. But every year, I have a practice, and that is I do think if you want to know what I make, you are welcome to that information. So I always make a, a larger than actual copy of my W-2. I put it on the front row of the seat. I've whited out my social security number so you can't <laughs> steal my identity. But you are more than welcome to know what I make. And uh, if you think I make too much, you can talk to the church council. If you think I make too little, you can keep that to yourself. But we're just grateful to be able to serve here. I think that's a really big deal. We also spent uh, $44,661 on office. That's all of our mailings, all of our copying, all of our printing, just a lot of money in order to keep communicating with our church family and those in our community. And then another $135,466 to our building. 
That means our mortgage, our principal, all of our utilities, our insurances, any maintenance, upkeep, anything that we're doing with our property here. So that uh, is all of our expenses totaling $802,063. Now, I mentioned missions, and missions is a really big deal to us because we simply refuse to consume every dollar that comes into us on ourselves. So we give a lot of way. We gave, you gave uh, over $49,000 to missions. We actually gave 13,000 more than that. We support over 26 missionaries across our world because we think that no one, no matter where they live, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their education, no matter their income, no one should have a barrier to the grace of God. Wherever you are, God is, and we think you should be able to discover his grace for yourself. We also had 168 people who participated in raising over uh, $12,000, almost $13,000 for Aki's Place, which is this wonderful place in Bangladesh where girls have been rescued from what would have been human trafficking situations. And not only do they have a safe place to live and they get food every day, but they're getting an education, including a college education. And when they grow up, they will have options that no one in their family has ever had before. And so we have uh, 253 gifts that were given in Angel Tree. And this means that, that children whose parents are in jail and that parent can't get anything for them. You showed up and wrapped a present in their parent's name and that child was remembered on that day. And I'm so grateful for that. And then another 66 shoe boxes and Christmas in July that we do. I think that's absolutely uh, phenomenal, your generosity towards that. And the people that we help with all of these, our missionaries, are very grateful too, and in fact, they wanted some of them wanted to say thank you to you. Hello, Calvary Assembly. This is the Spencer family. We just arrived here in Brazzaville, Congo. Hi, we're Doug and Jackie Ra. We're your missionaries in the Netherlands. Tim and Debbie Anderson uh, from Quito, Ecuador. We are Archie and Nancy McGlawn. Hi, I'm Dave Jacob. My family and I are missionaries to Northern Asia. This is Deanna Richardson talking to you from Bangkok, Thailand. Hi, we're Steve and Jill McCarthy, missionaries in Uruguay, South America. Hi guys, this is um, Terry and Bridget Roche coming to you from the mountains of Panama. Hello and greetings from Colombia. Thank you from the Linaways in the Netherlands. Thank you so much for your faithful support all these years. We love you and we thank you. Thanks to your faithful support and prayers. We just want to send you a thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for praying and giving to missions. Thank you so much for all of your prayers and support. This past year, we were able to train 67 new church planners and launch over 20 new churches in the least rich parts of Uruguay. Just want to say thank you so much for your faithful support. Thanks for partnering with us. And we just want to say thank you very much for your prayers and your support. Thank you so much for blessing Aki's Place in Bangladesh again and again. Through Run to the End and through other donations, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Mama. We love you. I saw the young couple, the McCarthys, and they're just phenomenal. I absolutely love this couple. There's so many creative ways that people reach others with the grace of God. They do it with a soccer ball. The first year they were on the mission field, they, they walked into a village where no one had heard the gospel before, and all they had was a soccer ball. And they just put it down on the ground and started kicking it around, and kids started showing up, and then their parents started showing up, and they just started sharing the grace of God. And that year, not only did lots of people come to the grace of God and receive that into their lives, but they formed communities of faith, they trained up leaders, they built buildings for churches. The first year, they started with nothing but a soccer ball. This year, there's over 20 churches that will be launched using their method of extending the grace of God. I think that's absolutely phenomenal. And then we saw the Rots who were in the Netherlands. Their way of... Um, of extending the gospel. They actually have gospel choirs. It's hugely popular in the Netherlands. And I'm talking about black gospel music. And so they get these choirs and people want to learn how to sing it. And all the people who come don't know anything about God and they don't know anything about Jesus. They just know they like this music. And person after person after person discovers the grace of God for themselves and then they plug them into a local church in the Netherlands. It's just absolutely phenomenal what some of our folks are doing and I'm so grateful for that. And then there's benevolence. 
Simple truth is you don't have to go halfway around the world to find someone who's going through a crisis that they can't get out of on their own. Sometimes we don't have to go out of our community or even our church family. And we think that we are called to minister to needs, not just to needs that are only here or only somewhere else. And so throughout the course of the year, we spend a lot of resources assisting people. In fact, here's one family who wanted to say thank you to you today.
Every number represents a person. Every person has a story. And I get to hear most of these stories throughout the course of a year. I have a huge advantage in that area. And there are lots of people who at night when they go to bed, they whisper a prayer of gratitude to God because of people who were generous with them. And that's what you have done. And Jesus said, this is how it's supposed to work. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good do deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We think that's a really big deal. God has also blessed us with children. If you haven't noticed around here, we've got lots of kids. In fact, in the last year, I, did, I lost count of the number of babies that were born. I already mentioned to you, I think, our, my office has been converted to a nursing mother's room. I, you see me on, when I'm done with the service, I go into the storage area over there. That's, <laughs> there's a little office that we, we built in there for our administrator, and that's where I go sit down in between the services. It's absolutely amazing. Over 100 children every week are served here by over 100 volunteers in children's ministry. And it's not just on Sundays, it's also on Wednesdays. And then there's our students. On Wednesday evening, almost 70 students alone show up just to be included in learning more about God and in worshiping Him. And here's what fascinates me is those students have been inviting their friends and over 95 other students who were disconnected from church or God showed up in places like this because their friends were generous enough to invite them. We think that's a really big deal. Well, that just says something about our student ministry, right? When lots of students might be embarrassed by their faith, our students are actually confident enough to invite others to join in it. And then there's our college ministry. And this absolutely astonishes me because this is a demographic where everyone in our culture tells us they are disinterested and disconnected from God and from church. And if you look at the numbers nationally, it's very disheartening. But for whatever reason, God has blessed our church family and college students, regardless of what school that they are in, have come here and connected here. And it has grown so much that we've had to staff for it. In fact, uh, it's grown so much. Uh, well, I'll let uh, uh, you hear this video and you can just see some of the stuff we're launching this year. Outpost was designed to minister to college students. Um, or college age students. So most people in our ministry are 18 to about 21. When we were coming up with the name, we thought about what we wanted uh, the mission of this whole thing to be. And so we came up with the name for Outpost. And the idea behind that is, you know, when, when you're on a frontier, when you're going to new places, um, you always have a, an outpost that you can come back to to get resupplied, refueled, you know, find other people who are on the frontier with you that are kind of going through the same things. And so we decided that outpost would be a great name to kind of signify you know, a place of community. What we do is it was kind of like an offshoot of life groups and it still is an offshoot of life groups where we meet every other week. Um, we started off with one group that met Tuesdays uh, every other week. And then last semester in the fall, um, we started kind of doing events outside of the life groups. And at the first event, we actually had about 50 people show up and we were like, oh shoot, we might have to, uh, we might have to build more than one life group. So we started a second life group that meets on Wednesdays every other week as well. But we've also started designing these large group events where we get both the Tuesday and Wednesday night groups together and we meet downstairs in the youth room actually, and we do worship and we always have a meal together that's home cooked by people here at Calvary. And then we also try to do a couple things in the middle that, you know, just incorporate discipleship and fellowship. So one time we did communion and, you know, just an extended worship time together. The last time that we did it, uh, Ben Loggenbaugh, who um, leads our all of the young adult ministries, he facilitated a time of like intentional prayer and just stillness. And it was really good. A big part of our ministry is getting people connected, not just to the community that they have with other college students, but also at the church family at large. So being able to come to events like Currents or coming, you know, on Sunday mornings and getting to meet people um, who 
who aren't just college students. We know that some of our students are starting to get involved in serving with our children's ministry. Some of our students are getting involved with serving with a second student ministry and involved in the worship team and all kinds of stuff. So that's that's something that I think is really special about Outpost that kind of makes us a little bit different. And it's a really big thing that's on my heart is making sure people feel connected, not just you know at the college level, but with students outside of their college and then with people outside of their college as well. So that young man's name is John. He was invited by one of our students when he was in high school to show up here on a youth Sunday. And he's been hanging around ever since. And he went to college to learn how to be a ministry. And then he came back and we brought him on staff because he has such an amazing heart to reach people with the grace of God. I think that's absolutely phenomenal. Amen. So in 2 Peter, you know I couldn't get through a day without a scripture, right? In 2 Peter, it says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. His son understands slowness. But he is, what's his next word? Patient with who? Yes, with you. He's patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish. But everyone to come to repentance. Never doubt the heart of our loving Heavenly Father. He is patient, and he doesn't want a single person to live a graceless life because a graceless moment can wreck an entire life, but a grace-filled moment can change a life for eternity. And he wants every single person to experience that. It creates a set of challenges around here. If you'd have seen this 20 years ago, we were in a different facility and we had less than 20 people. And everyone in that group had a great time together and we all loved each other. But God kept adding to our number and there's always been a concern is that if we keep adding people, it will change us. And this is the thing that we have discovered. Our hospitality shouldn't be determined by the size of our, by the, it should be determined by the size of our heart, not by the size of our facility. So we have some expansion plans, but here's what I want you to see. We believe that welcoming more people will not change who we are. We believe what changes us is if we stop welcoming people. If our church stops being outreach oriented, if it stops being generous, if it stops inviting people in, I don't know who we would become and I don't ever want to find that out. So the simple truth is we have some, some facility challenges around here. And the facility challenges have to do with the fact that on second service, we've had Sundays where we didn't have enough seats for people. We're in the process of adding 61 spaces to the parking lot because there were people who have tried to find a place and then they just drove home. Our classrooms are becoming increasingly more full with little children and our student space is getting more and more cramped. And our office space, you should see that. Not only do I spend a fair amount of time in the storage room, We've got up to two staff members in closets that we now call an office. And we want to increase space for fellowship. And so how do we even think about this or plan for this? And this is the first thing I want you to see. Last year, after we paid our expenses from our income, some monies have been restricted. They're, they're designated for specific things, so we can't touch them. They, they have specific purposes. But the amount of money left over just from last year is $373,783. We didn't have to stop being generous. We didn't have to pare back ministry. We didn't have to unfund missionaries. We did all of that beyond our commitments and our promises. And we still had a surplus of over $373,000 in the year 2017. I think that's something to give God a hand for. So this is what our bank statement looks like. When you add up everything we have available assets to us, it's $665,176.30. And this year, we're going to bring on a couple of additional staff. But here's what I want you to know, is that we know, leadership has known, this facility would start limiting our hospitality unless we did something about it. And so... Later this year, 
we're already in planning stage, and later this year, we're going to start a conversation with our church family about what a future expansion could look like. And we will expand every area that we need in our church, and we will use every square inch that we currently have. We're not relocating to a different property. We think that there's ways to make this work because we honestly believe that there are still lots of people who desperately need to be connected to the grace of God. And we are unrelentingly committed to that. So before we've even addressed the issue or asked for any money, our church leadership out of wise stewardship has already been able to put away significant resources to give us a head start on that when that time comes. And I think that's absolutely amazing. So this is what I'd like you to know. It never gets old to me, not one time, when people's lives connect with the grace of God and the trajectory changes forever. I can't believe how good God is, how much he loves us, and I love seeing what he does in people's lives. And you are making that possible because every number represents a person. Every person has a story and every person matters to God, and they matter to us. Would you stand with me and join in the song this morning? Come on, let's sing all.